So how do you avoid the problem like that governments have where they only create laws, but then never undo old laws and you just get too much bloat? Like, how do you de like vestigial bodies? Like, Great question. So what we tell organizations is that every year when you do your disaster recovery test, which you're generally going to do at the end of the year between Christmas and New Year's, that's what most people do. What you're also going to do is you're going to schedule cool. your standards off. So yeah. each year you're going to audit all the standards you have and decide whether they still apply to your organization. You may demote a red standard to blue. You may say, you know what? This is no more. This, this is no longer enforceable. It's op optional. You also end up with red and blue namespaces together. So I may have a red namespace or object model that has a blue non-standard namespace inside of it. And the only part, the only enterprise, the only part of the data that the enterprise model uses, that an enterprise application uses, is the stuff that's red. The blue stuff's still there, but it doesn't use it, doesn't need it because it's for some other function. How does the red and blue standards apply to when you're using, because that's what I thought you were going to say at first was using Spark Plug B and MQTT, like, you know, vanilla inside of the same namespace. Right. So in general, in general, and lately we have been in, you know, I would say five, six years ago, we were converting most namespaces. If you were to look at the unified namespace at the enterprise level. So as we coalesce namespaces when we're moving up the infrastructure. When you were to go and look at the master namespace, the unified namespace in the cloud, that was almost always Spark Plug B. Like if you were going to consume it, you were going to consume it as a edge of network node from the cloud as a Spark Plug B edge of network node. We have really moved away from that and kept the Spark Plug B down at the site level. And in the cloud, we're vanilla. MQTT. Generally, when we're using MQTT for the namespace, which is common, we're generally flat MQTT. So what we have is Spark Plug B from the sites. So edge of network node, edge of network node, edge of network node. And then we have a unified namespace in the broker that's mapping to the Spark Plug. That's generally how we're doing it now. But in the old days, what you would have is flat and Spark Plug together and then create another Spark Plug namespace or flat that coalesce the two together. That's the way we used to do it. Sure. And now it's become more, we're, we're more focused on vanilla MQTT. The reason why? Kind of using the site to convert Sparkplug namespace and publish into a vanilla namespace at like an enterprise cloud layer? Correct. Yes. That sounds like, but aren't you losing some of those advantages that Sparkplug was giving you, like kind of rolling everything up into one object and the compression for publishing or? Well, you don't lose it at the site level. I mean, because you're you're publishing the site as an edge of network node. You're publishing the site itself. Now, there's a lot of people in the community that keep Sparkplug even lower. So they may not do Sparkplug beyond an asset. So an asset would become a Sparkplug edge of network node. Line or something or right. an area. Production line or an area. But we're doing it at the site level. Um, here, let me let me get to these. Uh, I want to I want to read this this message here. So after what Akos said, I said, you know, the this is the crux of it right here. Akos nails the protocol conversion. Actually, JS commented, and he uh, Jeff Schrader, who's who's at a uh, high bite. He said this is a great way of putting it regarding semantics. Interoperability takes much more than just protocol conversion. Yes, it does. Protocol conversion is less than five percent of the effort, in my opinion. I totally agree. Protocol conversion, honestly, is the easy part. The harder part is managing what's sent through the protocols, like on the wire. And so my response was, this is the crux of it right here. Akos nails the protocol conversion in standard con conversation, but at the end of the day, the data and information models that are sent over the wire are where the rubber meets the road. Standards generally attempt to be everything to everyone, which is why they end up with low adoption. The beauty of unified namespace with pub sub is that you can define on the edge which parts of the standard to use while concurrently bolting on ad hoc definitions and parameters. Red, red and blue. Yeah, you can bolt blue onto red, right? Um, to standard models. Which standard is far which, which standard you use is far less important than insisting that data and info models account for both standard and non-standard parameters. So it's very important. Say that, that again. So the standard you choose to use, okay, so all the standards that ACOS listed, 
which standard you choose you choose to use to do data modeling is far less important than insisting that the data and information models that you are creating account for both standardized and non-standardized parameters so that they can live together. So when I look at a data model, I may not be looking at a standard data model. I may be looking at a, a standard data model plus non-standard uh, parameters. And then the consumer, only co the, the enterprise consumer only consumes the standard stuff, all right? Why would why would they only consume the standard stuff just for simplicity at the enterprise well, layer or yeah yeah at the enterprise level you only you want to consume standard stuff I mean for enterprise class you need standardization right right um and so then you roll up your OE at every single facility and you're not necessarily carrying that one facility's making bolts the other facility's making straps yeah th this is the you know this is the what Jeff Noonan said. So he commented to me and he said, Walker, how do you stop that from becoming an unmanaged nightmare at scale when you have multiple teams across multiple sites, all publishing and subscribing without schema enforcement? I've been through that a few times and it's not a fun place to be. MQTT lacks a schema registry for the payloads and the topics. All right. And so what I said was to Jeff, Red models, red models, or you guys may have heard me use the term heterogeneous or homogeneous. That, so heterogeneous is blue, homogeneous is red. Okay, heterogeneous means um, diverse and unified, and homogeneous means standard. Right, it, everything's the same. So you red means by heterosexual and homosexual. Correct. Right. So uh, what I say is, red models, the standard models, are the only models that need to be managed, and blue models are tracked for quality and for, and for potential promotion to red. That's how you manage it. Lacking a schema registry in MQTT is a problem. Yes, but is currently managed with external services that monitor the broker namespaces and leverage regex for pattern matching. So all you have to do is for every red model you create, you create a regex pattern match, and then you just scan the broker namespace for it. That's how we do it externally. So that's okay. how you enforce that red model and you can identify people that are not adhering to it? Correct, exactly. So this is why MQTT, but I follow up with, this is part of the reason I'm going to the MQTT Summit, CONAC in, in uh, Munich, in December 7th. That's one of the announcements we have. And this is one of the reasons I'm going there is I'm gonna go and pitch to other MQTT um, thought leaders and decision makers on why it is we need to extend the standard to support methods so or a GraphQL plugin so that we can query the namespace. Right now, you have to build an external, an external service to do it, right? And those services work great. We've been doing them for years, and we're just really used to it. But it'd be great if it was just supported in the MQTT standard, okay? So I said, this is why MQTT needs methods and or a GraphQL plugin for querying the namespace without the need for external services. It isn't difficult to manage if the external services are built correctly. Schema enforcement outside of red models is completely unnecessary. What matters is minimum technical requirements for OEMs and developers that enforce the rules for application. It is imperative that citizen developers solve their problems in service of the org's digital strategy in the same infrastructure that the standardized business operates. This, mm. is how, this is how digital infrastructure solutions applications remain agile and adjust with the business's needs. And then I wanna say, I wanna say one other thing. So Jeff Noonan also said, on a second response to the same message I sent, he said, ISA 95 has low adoption because the original intent of the standard is solving a problem that few people or companies care deeply about. That is plug and play integration between COTS, ERP, and COTS MOM. Honestly, who cares when in the 30 years of the standard, neither the ERP vendors or the MOM vendors have adopted the standard for integration. ISA 95 has also has low adoption because pub sub architectures are relatively new in manufacturing and data hub architectures are even newer. But the standard schemas defined by part two and four are well suited to defining the schemas that get published and subscribed and even more suited to how you store all those messages in a data hub. History should not be taken as an accurate prediction of the future. I would argue, first off, I didn't say this in my follow-up, but uh, <laughs> his, history is a very accurate predictor of the future.
Okay. Um, without mitigation. So if you look at it, if you look at history without mitigation or innovation, you can predict the future. I mean, this is, we do That's this. Why you bought the cameras with your tool budget. <laughs> Correct. This is this machine learning machine learning <laughs> has demonstrates that to us. Yeah. If, if history shouldn't be taken as an accurate prediction in the future, the machine learning doesn't work. Pattern matching doesn't work. Mm -hmm. What there has to be is some mitigation or innovation that will change the future. You want yeah. blue objects in your organization. There's something to be said about the number of blue objects and the rate of them popping yeah, up. But if you have a low number of blue objects, you have a low rate of innovation. It's easily measured. Okay. Here's what I, here's what I said though, to that response. I said to Jeff, Jeff, I agree about 90% here. I think part four, ISA 95 part four is completely useless and will need a complete rewrite. Part two is the only part of ISA 95 that has any value for industry four. The reason why is because it's completely decoupled from part one and part one is what defines Purdue. Okay. So it, part two is the only part of ISA 95 that's decoupled from part one. All right. I would also add that many OEMs have implemented ISA 95 incorrectly. So instead, what they do is they try to enforce models over create solutions that consume events in complete context, which, by the way, Dennis Brandel, who sits on the committee, told told and acknowledged was a limitation of the implementation. Most people are implementing ISA 95 wrong. They are trying to enforce models from ISA 95 when they're building solutions, when what they're supposed to be doing is creating an infrastructure to consume events in their full context. Okay. And that has driven low adoption on the user side. Great comments, Jeff. All right.